Okay, well, it looks like we're all here. So um, the next three sessions that we're having in this, uh, this, this auditorium is going to be extending beyond the enterprise. And uh, so the first talk that we've got in that session is Fadi Saman from AOL, VP at AOL, or the company previously known as AOL, as things go like this. Um, and talking about extending the program beyond the enterprise and sort of going off of that thread. So without any further ado, Fadi. Thank you. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Thanks uh, for, for joining me this afternoon. Um, so, you know, as Alan said, you know, like, uh, if, if you look today, uh, many of the uh, identity access management solutions tend to be uh, enterprise or corporate focused. Uh, in this talk today, I'll uh, describe how AOL, you know, we evolved our um, IAM solution to go well beyond the enterprise uh, by leveraging the industry standards to cover various B2B use cases. And I also want to talk a little bit about the initiatives that we've implemented to ease the integration and uh, make the uh, migration as seamless as possible. Uh, historically, uh, at AOL, the consumer identity system uh, was used to basically protect internal apps. Uh, then, in the late 90s and, uh, and at uh, the 2000s, we had several big, big acquisitions. Uh, and then, at that point, it became you know, clear to us that uh, an enterprise-focused IEM solution was, was needed. Um, the initial solution was basically managed uh, by a decentralized org with shared responsibility. And the reason I mentioned that is because you'll see how kind of like it evolved. Um, the primary purpose of it, as I stated, was to basically protect the enterprise and the enterprise users and apps. Um, it had you know, the capabilities that you would expect of such a solution around uh, lifecycle management, SSO, uh, security policies. Uh, the solution itself was based on a commercial open source uh, IAM product, um, but because of that decentralized uh, management that I mentioned, uh, we had different teams basically managing the uh, you know, user experience. So you had inconsistent uh, auth and, and security policies. Uh, session management was basically uh, you managed through the uh, vendor-specific APIs, uh, it wasn't using industry standards. Uh, and there was a lack of a common um, authorization solution, which led various product teams to basically build their own custom solution. So this solution stayed in place for several years, going through you know, your typical upgrade uh, product cycles, uh, but it was really lacking the needed attention and focus uh, to meet some of the need of the growing list of B2B uh, products that we, that we had. So about Three years ago, uh, we made the decision at AOL to really pay attention to the uh, enterprise IAM solution. And what we did is we moved it into the identity team, uh, which at that, up until that point was responsible for the consumer identity uh, side of things only. And the reason for that was to take advantage of the skill set you know, around identity and security that was built on that team. So uh, there, the immediate focus was really on stabilizing the platform. The platform had been suffering from you know, various outages, and it was impacting customers uh, and their users. Uh, we also uh, did the necessary you know, upgrades, improving the, you know, upgrading to the latest version of the software. In addition to that, also, we started the customization to meet some of the uh, B2B requirements, not all of them. Um, but then with more acquisitions and a growing list of B2B products coming on board, uh, it became obvious to us that we really need to, to think differently here. We need a, a new solution that not only focused on enterprise use cases, but that well, you know, went well into the B2B world. Uh, so for that, we basically evaluated several IAM products. Many of them are here you know, uh, at the expo. Uh, we, did, we implemented several POCs. And while in parallel, we really engage with our uh, internal partners on the B2B side, trying to understand what their vision uh, is, what their products are, you know, what are the requirements, before we've settled on the current solution that I'll go over right now. Um, as far as core capabilities, uh, you know, the platform you know, was, based, was centered around authentication with login, SSO, and logout flows, authorization, 
both for user authorization and consent, server to server, API authorization, obviously, and it supports identity federation as well. We wanted the platform to be uh, secure, and we wanted it to be based on, uh, on, on standards, and that was a critical thing for us, uh, and you'll see why you know, in the coming slides. Uh, we also wanted it to be easy to integrate and user protecting. So what are these B2B requirements that I've been kind of hinting around? Um, as I stated, as we were basically doing our um, research around you know, the, the next generation uh, IAM uh, platform, we basically met with a lot of the B2B product owners. And as a result of the conversation and, and the vision that they had presented to us, we collected a list of, of B2B requirements. Uh, that, uh, and these requirements we felt that were unique to the B2B products, or, the, that, or at a minimum that were different enough from the enterprise ones. Um, and, and those requirements really centered around user provisioning and deprovisioning. And there, unlike the enterprise where you typically have one single uh, user data store, uh, there was a need for, for these products to have multiple data stores. Um, Many of them were doing user migration from one data store to the other, so we needed to support that. Uh, many of the products wanted their own custom UI, uh, and they wanted their own security uh, policies. Uh, they needed support for their uh, API management and client management. Um, uh, they needed support for social login authentication. Uh, some, uh, some of the uh, uh, products had partners that required their users to authenticate via their own IDP. And they had you know, their own specific uh, tracking uh, and, and, and metrics. In addition to the B2B uh, requirements, we also had tenant-specific ones. And with tenants, you know, what we wanted to do, we wanted each product to have their own set of users, rules, uh, and policies. Uh, and, and those requirements, again, centered around user consent. Um, we needed uh, unique tenant-specific user identifier uh, and its management, custom UI, again, you know, external data stores, uh, support for various uh, password encryptions, uh, authentication, MFA policies, site-specific policies, managing OI, uh, OAuth and YDC clients, uh, supporting uh, uh, federation flows, the ability to define scopes, uh, and need for APIs for client, client, token, user, and session management. Now, to get a better sense of how all these requirements fit together, uh, I'm going to go over two of the uh, most important use cases that we had to support, and those are the cross-tenant user authentication and the cross-tenant token authorization. In the uh, cross-tenant uh, uh, user authentication use case, what we had here is we had, you know, as I mentioned, products that, that had to support both external customers and internal customers, AOL employees, basically. Um, and they wanted the UI policy flows of the tenant to be enforced for that uh, tenant's users. Uh, and lastly, they wanted the user claims tied to a unique identifier uh, for each tenant, even if the login identifier is the same. Um, the way we solve for that, we've implemented what we call the um, tenant router. And uh, really, the tenant router at its core is an identifier first flow. Uh, so the identifier check basically will result in the specific uh, uh, UI uh, and, and security policies. Uh, the, the, the tenant router also supports, a, the UI supports a login hint, um, allowing you to bypass having to enter the login ID once you're directed to the owning tenant UI. So what this did is really it helped us, uh, you know, avoid duplicating authentication policies and data stores. The uh, best way to kind of describe this, this use case is by showing you um, the login sequence uh, for one of our uh, B2B applications. So as you can see, uh, this is the login uh, screen for our B2B application. I don't know if you can see the, the difference, but it has its own kind of like a custom UI. It's really a gray back background. And so if you happen to be an internal user, an AOL employee, and you land on this page and you want to authenticate, you enter your login ID and then the identifier check then determines that you're an internal uh, user belonging to the internal tenant. It gives you a different custom UI. 
again, I don't know if you can see the background, there's like a different custom UI here be behind it. And it enforces that specific tenant's uh, security policies. In this case, for uh, internal employees, you need to basically uh, enter uh, a secondary, to pass up a secondary challenge. So you enter the one-time password and you're logged in. Now, if you happen to be an external user and you land on this page, again, the, uh, you enter your login ID and the identifier check will result in you belonging to the external tenant. There, you'll get the, you know, you'll continue with that external tenant custom UI, which is the same background. And in this case, there's really no MFA. It's a different security policy. So once you hit the password, you're in. So that was one of you know like the use case around token author uh, token uh, cross tenant token uh, excuse me cross tenant user authentication. Now the other use case is uh, around the cross tenant token authorization, and this one is a bit complicated. So, uh, but let me kind of like guide you through it. What you have here is multiple tenants, say tenant A and tenant B, and tenant A wants to basically manage its own OAuth clients, but it needs to leverage uh, an application in tenant B for fine-grained authorization for its entitlement uh, server. And it wants to avoid multiple introspection checks, right? And then similar to the previous use case, uh, the tenant A wants to allow users to log in uh, through a different login UI flow, uh, but leverage tenant B application, you know, federating introspection check to it, right? And the claims must contain a unique identifier tied to the introspecting uh, tenant. So what I'll try to do is I'll take you through the, the three flow diagrams here to kind of like give you an idea, a better idea of what the use case is and how we solve for it. So imagine if these, uh, you know, like actors, all these apps belong to a single tenant, right? Uh, uh, let's say that the external client is some, some application, some, you know, a bank application that is requesting a, a reporting dashboard from the reporting API. Um, uh, service. However, the reporting API, before it can basically deliver that dashboard, it needs to check with the entitlement server to get those specific entitlements for that client. Again, here we're talking server-to-server -server interaction, right? So in this case, the entitlement server with the client ID2 is allowed to introspect to you know, tokens uh, for the reporting API because it's within you know, the same tenant. So it's easy, right? Introspect, it validates that it's a proper uh, client of tenant A, sends the ent entitlements back to the reporting API, and then the, the, the client gets the dashboard. Now imagine that use case where you have two separate tenants. Right? Now the entitlement server is no longer part of tenant A, but it's part of a, a second tenant, tenant B. And the reason this is uh, a case for us is because that entitlement server is used by many of the other products that we have, so it had to be in a separate tenant. So as you can see, uh, the flow gets really complicated. You have to have multiple introspection calls, you know, one on the, within tenant A validating the access token coming from the, uh, the, the service client by the reporting API, and then the enti entitlement server uh, in tenant B has to also introspect the client coming from the reporting API being part of a, you know, client, uh, being part of tenant B also. And only then it can basically send the right entitlements. So the way we solved for this was basically allowing cross-tenant introspection. So now the ent entitlement server, which happens to be part of tenant B, we made it that it's okay for it to introspect tenant A client. And as you can see, this simplified the integration tremendously and allowed us you know, to, to save many of the introspection calls and, and really um, simplified the integration. So as you can imagine, you know, uh, for an effort like this uh, to be successful, a lot has, you know, has to go through it. Um, you know, a, lot, a lot went through it. And, and really, uh, what, what helped us was uh, uh, we, we, to, to basically help alleviate uh, developer concerns around you know, integration, uh, we built modules and tools. Making these modules available uh, helped us simplify the integration and, while uh, being flexible in basically rolling out our security you know, consistently across the different products. Um, what we did is we started with um, open source modules, uh, then we modified them 
to, to work with our multi-tenant solution. Uh, we made modules available for Apache, Nginx, and Node. Uh, you know, protecting APIs using OAuth is great, but developers really don't want to handle uh, token caching and introspection. Again, the modules take care of that. Um, using uh, open standards forces uh, the servers and apps to, to manage user sessions. Again, here, you know, we made it easy uh, for, for developers by having the modules manage sessions on behalf of the apps with support for uh, Memcache and Redis. Uh, single page application, they use the um, OIDC implicit flow, which is not trivial to, trivial to implement. Uh, what we did is we, we made changes to the module to allow the return of tokens to the single page app via simple API call. Uh, in addition to many other things, you know, around uh, C C CSRF protection and replay attacks uh, and client-side token validation. In addition to the, um, <clears throat> you know, the integration, we also uh, wanted the migration to be seamless. Uh, and to support that, we basically went and supported the OAuth token in our legacy side of the, uh, the, the, the system. What we did is we, we had the legacy platform, we built a new platform, and we added support to the legacy platform to, to support the OAuth token. This way, as the apps were mi migrating from the legacy to the, to the new system, uh, it, it, it was seamless. There was really no downtime because the, the, the legacy platform could support both tokens, the legacy tokens and the new OAuth tokens. Uh, we also had to partner you know, with various teams across the company, uh, products, security, engineering, um, really to get them to, to become familiar with the standards, uh, get them to understand them and support us. Um, for that, really, we had to do a lot of education, a lot of hand-holding. Uh, we had to provide reference implementation code, uh, documentation, a lot of documentation, and troubleshooting help. Finally, you know, uh, the reason I feel we were successful is not only because we provided all these different capabilities, but from the get-go, we, we made sure that we have executive support. Something of this magnitude, you've got to get executive buy-in from the get-go. Otherwise, you, you know, you're not going to be successful. The other thing that I feel helped us a lot was that we started with an existing IAM product. Don't try to recreate the wheel yourselves. Many of these products are here today, you know, out in the expo. Uh, these products are good and they're getting better uh, by the day. But just keep in mind that in certain cases, you know, I haven't seen a single product that is going to support all of your use cases. So in some instances, you have to basically roll up your sleeves and do some customization. Um, you know, the standard worked for us. Uh, it allowed us to tap into the open source community for tools and, and, and support. Um, and, and documentation. Documentation is critical. Even if it's for your own internal customers, your documentation, you have to have that mindset that the documentation has to be as good as if your product was being you know, uh, marketed externally. And I think this is it. So we have a few minutes. Thank you. We have, I think, a couple of minutes for some questions, Alan. Yep. So. I got a question for you around um, your first use case. You created a, a custom router that routed based on you know what type of identity or your, your, that is accessing that website. Um, how did you arrive to the conclusion that you don't want multi-factor for these people, but for these people you do? It's kind of sometimes you kind of think you just want to do it across the board. How did you come to the conclusion that well, you know we don't want MFA for these guys? Well, it wasn't, I mean, if it was my decision, I would want to enforce MFA across the board. But we really left it up to the product uh, and the business owner to, to make that decision, right? So with our solution, you know, because some of our external, some of our products have external customers, and some of these external customers don't want to use MFA, right? And their business owner is okay with that. So we, you know, the tenant router allows us to basically uh, figure out what tenant that user belongs to, and you know, it, it, then it allows you to basically figure the custom UI that you want for that tenant, along with the security policies associated with that tenant. But yeah, from a security perspective, I want MFA for everybody. But <laughs> hi, um, you mentioned that you have single page app as PAs. Yeah. 
So in a traditional web access management, you end up having your, um, your web servers being protected by whatever agent of the SSO product it is. So that is guarding the front door. How does that work with an SPA where there's no front door, the SPA is basically redirecting you to all your other resources? Yeah, I mean, we, like I said, we use the implicit uh, OIDC implicit flow. Now, it's not as, as secure as the authorization code flow, but you know, for, for a single page app, it was, it was good enough. You gotta trust that, that basically application that, that you're using the implicit flow with. Hey, uh, can you describe a little bit more about the integration tools you, you developed to ensure that you know, partners are, don't look at this as a behemoth challenge for them, it, yeah. it actually becomes easy for them? Can you describe that a little bit more? Sure, yeah, I mean, the, the previous solution, the, the early solution was relying on a, you know, kind of like a vendor-specific uh, 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 proxies. Uh, when we basically move to the standards, and that's the reason why we were, you know, driving, you know, to leveraging the standards, because we knew that there are modules out there, you know, like Apache or Nginx or Node modules that did that OIDC interaction or OAuth2 interaction for you. Now, like I said, many of these uh, modules that we got from the open source community did not exactly meet uh, all of our requirements, so we had to modify them. But the fact that they were available really saved us a lot of time in, in doing so. But at the core, they support OIDC and, and OAuth 2. You said you built some custom modules for each of those different web servers. Did you uh, also try doing something for HA proxy? Uh, for what? Sorry. For HA proxy kind of uh, open source no. load balancers? No, but I mean, you know, that's not to say that we're not, right? I mean, it's. Uh, uh, one more question regarding where you had multi-tenant, the uh, introspection endpoint where you tried to minimize those introspection calls. Uh, could you explain that a little bit more in detail, like how you um, made the tenant be able to trust uh, access token given by one tenant by another tenant? So is that an enhancement? Well, because the, the reason it is because all, all these tenants are using the same kind of like underlying authorization service that we own. Right, so even though they are separate tenants, but because we know that these tenants, you know, belong part of that same authorization server, right? So we, 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 we can we can establish that trust. And the reason we had to do it that way, like I said, because that entitlement server is there to service many of the B2B products, right? So we didn't want to duplicate that, you know, fine-grained authorization with every single tenant. But yeah, I mean, like all these applications, they come to us, they register their client ID in secret, right, before they actually can start using them. We've got time for one more question, and I saw the hand go up, so. Uh, behind the scenes, you still must be doing uh, in-house um, internal IDM provisioning, deprovisioning. JML, we call it, where I work is uh, joiners, movers, leavers. Uh, how did that get affected by the solution at all, or did you drop certain solutions or pick no. up new ones for that? No, no, I mean, we, we were still using the same, yeah. Thank you very much, Friday. That Thank takes you, us, I think, to the time. Uh, will you be around for the rest of the evening? I will be. Yeah. So any more so, questions, if you yeah, want to grab and talk afterwards, Definitely. you'll be available. Yeah. So thank you all, and the next session in here starts Thank in you. about 10 minutes.